still have the verses where we're going to begin. We're going to begin in Genesis 1-1 this morning. I remember when I was in seminary serving as a teaching assistant in Old Testament class. I was a teaching assistant working under the professor. And when it came my time to share with the students, I'd say, if you don't know what to share and you're at preach, start in Genesis 1-1. Just keep reading the word. That's not strike you. <laughs> That's not how to tell them. So Genesis 1-1 is where we're going to begin this morning. Genesis 1-1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're going to read one more passage here this morning. Acts 17, 24 to 25. We'll read them all, but we're going to read these two before we uh, get into it here this morning. Acts 17, 24 to 25 says this. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. We've been in a series on Sunday mornings on the attributes of God. And I mentioned it's important to know who God is. You know, a lot of people, they'll use the generic word God, and yet they don't have a description of the God of Scripture. And how many know the only true God is the God of Scripture? Yeah. So if you have a God, in quotes, that's capricious in some way, or that uh, one day he's one way and one day he's another way and the next day you don't know what you're going to get. That's not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If it is that you hear of a God who has some way whereby you can earn salvation through your works, your good works outweighing your bad, well then that's not the God of Scripture. For Scripture says... That all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Our righteousness and the best of our righteousness is his filthy rags. And that the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. That's what we've worked for. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the attributes of the true God telling about salvation. If you have a system of beliefs, a religious system of beliefs serving some God who says that there's, oh, Jesus is a way of salvation, but there's many ways up this mountain. The mountain peak, of course, is God. And so you may come up with the way of Jesus and someone else may come up the way of Muhammad and someone else may come up the way of Buddha. Now, listen. We don't hate those of false religions. We pray that God would convict them and draw them unto true salvation. But do understand, Scripture says there is one way of salvation. No other name but Jesus whereby we can be saved. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. So if there is some message or some God who says there's some other way to salvation other than Christ, well, then that's not the true living God. We need to know the attributes of God. I've mentioned before that if you've never done it, look your name up online sometime. Just put your name in and hit search. And a Google machine will bring up all sorts of things. I clicked in Ben Strunk before, and up came this blonde-haired, skinny-looking athletic fellow. <laughs> and I said, if uh, those who know me were to see that picture, and they said, yeah, that's Ben Strunk. They said, not the one I know. <laughs> Uh, even though they may use the same names, it doesn't mean that it's the same the Jesus, so to speak, if it is not defined by Scripture, His attributes. And as children of God, I've used this illustration. I've been married to my wonderful wife almost 16 years now, and I'm so thankful for that. But how many know it's good to get to know one another over the course of time? And if you're in Christ, uh, not that uh, we're perfect this side of glory, because we're not, but how many want to know him better next year should he tarry than you do this year. Yeah. We should want to know that and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've talked about various attributes, his praiseworthiness, his goodness, his holiness, which that's probably the number one attribute if I had to pick one, because he says God is holy, holy, holy. Okay? We've talked about the love of God last week. We've talked about the immutability of God that he never changes. We've talked about these various attributes, his omniscience, that he knows everything, his omnipotence, that he's all-powerful. Well, all of, the, of all the attributes we've talked about so far, this one this morning might have the strangest name, okay? But I'll go somewhere with it, but here's the name. It's spelled A-S-E-I-T-Y, A-S-E-I-T-Y. It's the aseity of God. Say that, aseity. Aseity. I see a what? I see a T. Now, what that means is that God is non-contingent. 
That means he does not depend upon anything or anyone else for his existence or for who he is. And why uh, we're going to look at this attribute from all, not all of scripture, but from several scriptures this morning. But I promise you, even though it's not a household name, that is deity of God, it's something that is very important for us to realize. We don't know anything of non-contingence, to be honest, in our own personal existence. What I mean by that, I, I saw a cartoon. I mentioned things are going up. One of those things going up is eggs. They yes. don't like eggs. Yes. And, and you've been getting eggs, and they ain't what they, you know. <laughs> In fact, I, I saw this cartoon as someone went out. They went and they were looking at jewelry somewhere. He said, this is expensive jewelry. It's going to cost an arm and an egg. <laughs> arm, and, arm and an egg. You will get that. <laughs> and because it was so expensive. Well, part of the reason why that is is because the eggs that you get at the store to buy, they come from farms where those birds have had avian flu and many birds have died. So there's not as many eggs as there used to be. And then what eggs that there are in existence right now, well, the way that they get them to market is through trucks. And these trucks burn diesel fuel, and diesel fuel is higher than what it used to be. So because of that, the eggs go up. And then the people that work at the stores, whether it be Publix or Walmart or Aldi's or wherever, they're having to pay higher wages than what they have paid in the past because things are up. And so when you see the price of that egg going up, well, it depended upon the flu of the birds. It depended upon less eggs in production. It depended upon higher uh, cost of transportation. It depended upon higher cost of labor. How many know there's a lot of things that go into even the small things because everything seems to depend upon something else. It's contingent. Contingent means depends. It depends upon something else. And we have a lot of things. I mean, how many have heard the word supply chain more than what you care to over the course of the past year or two? You can't get something because it depends upon something that is out or something that isn't working. And things that we used to take for granted, we find actually depend upon other things. I'm here to tell you this morning, you may say, you, you, some folks will say, I'll be in a church, of course, and I plan to be in church, but then if I'm real sick, well, maybe I can't be in church, or if this particular thing happens, or you plan to pay a bill next Friday, and you really plan to pay that bill, but then something happens, and the check doesn't come in, or the person loses. Everything we know in life seems to be contingent. Or dependent in some way upon other things over which we have little to no control. Not so with God. God is not contingent. He does not depend upon anything or anyone for his existence, for his power, for his goodness, for his love, for his unchangeableness, for the truth of his word, for his faith. God doesn't depend upon anything or anyone. God will never. Well, it depends upon if the sun's at the right angle, if I can say. He's the one who made the sun. Amen. God is non-contingent. He does not depend upon anything or anyone for his existence. And that's called the aseity of God. Now, where we see that in the first and opening way is in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that you see has been created. Everything that you know has been created. You yourself have been created. You came from somewhere. This pew came from something. But God has always been. in the. He is before the beginning, after the end. God, how many know he does not depend upon anything or anyone? I will tell you, and some of you have heard things like this in society. And unfortunately, even in churches, there's a, a very... Um, popular uh, idea amongst those who say they claim to be saving Christianity from itself. And they're not the first ones to claim such things. Christianity doesn't need saving from itself. Christianity needs proclaimed. Christ is the saving one. He needs saved from nothing. How many are thankful for that? But they will come and they will say, the younger generation, if you proclaim God is the creator, if you proclaim that he created all that is, and God forbid you actually proclaim that he created in seven days, which I don't believe. He did it in six days. He rested on the seventh. All right? But, but say if you proclaim that, 
then especially the younger generation is not going to believe in God because if science and the Bible uh, contradict, I've actually heard a pastor say this of multiple thousands that attend every weekend say, if science and the Bible contradict, science must win. I'm here to tell you, science has changed over the course of time. The greatest scientists, by the way, in history have been those who have believed in God because he created an orderly universe that could be studied. And they won't tell you that. That will tell you as well. You look, you show me the person with the highest intellect with the most numbers after his name, or letters after, I don't think they put numbers, just letters, <laughs> with the highest letters after his name that believes that everything came into being by chance. By accident. You show me the highest educated person that believes that. And I can show you just as high educated a person that believes that God created all that is in seven days. Can I tell you? It is not because of the difference in education. It's because one believes a scripture and one believes a lie. I'm here to tell you God created all that is. Nothing came into being except by him. And some will say, well, if, if you proclaim that, that's just Old Testament. This same very prominent pastor of multiple thousands writes books that are read by millions, goes to conferences all over, and sadly so that he will say, he'll say that Genesis is a myth, like another creation myth that other religions have. He's even called it a myth. Can I tell you, there's myths that uh, myths are not true. The Word of God is true. Amen. And he'll say, well, the Genesis, that's just Old Testament. Throw that out. That's part of it. Did you notice we read two passages yes. to begin with this morning? Acts is in the New Testament. Yes. It's, it's past Malachi. Okay. <laughs> it's in the right-hand side. And when you go to the right-hand side, you have, you have a, a Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels. And then you have the book of Acts. And what does the Apostle Paul do? The Apostle Paul, a very educated man. Not just did he know scripture, but he was educated in the, in the secular poets of the day and in the Greek civilization from which still we get a lot of worldly wisdom from the day. And he is in Athens. Athens is the zenith of intellectual knowledge at the time. He is like in the, you know, the Harvard and the Princeton of his day. He's in the, in the paragon of intellectual prowess when he's in Athens. And in Acts 17, what does he start out with? He says this, there is the God, not a God, God, the one true and living God. He's the God who created all that is. I, I don't know. I would rather go with Moses, to, who was inspired by God, of course, to write Genesis. And I'd rather go with Paul, who was inspired to preach in Acts 17. There was someone, Johnny come lately, who comes today and says you can't proclaim God as creator. God is creator. Amen. If anything's ever existed, someone has always existed, and that's the God of Scripture. He came from nothing. No one came before him. No force came before him. No ethereal cloud came before him. He is the non-contingent God. That means he is God who is God all by himself, and he's the God of creation. Amen. Now, I'm not a science expert by any means. I've studied it to some degree in, uh, in school, and I was a, a teaching assistant for a couple science professors as well. But I will tell you, I am kind of a math guy. And if you study math, you'll find these laws, law of the conservation of mass. That means mass is neither created nor destroyed. You law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It, just, it can be transferred from one thing to another, but it's not created or destroyed. I tell you, I don't know, but if I looked at that, I would hope, even from a scientific mindset, that means I can't introduce any new energy. I can't introduce really any more math. Uh, I can't introduce anything into this system. Well, who got it all going to begin with? How many know there's a God, the God of Scripture, who's non-contingent, who created all that is? And I've got good news for you. Not just is it important for us to proclaim this truth that God is creator. And I, some will say, well, can't we just say that God's not the creator and still preach Jesus crucified for our sins? Well, perhaps that can be done. Perhaps it can be. But I will tell you, uh, if you start to compromise on God as creator, it won't be long until you compromise on a lot of other things, too. God is the creator. Nothing came before him. Or contributed to his existence. He has always been. Yeah. Always been. And I got good news for you. 
Not only is that a great truth when we think of the world at large, but do you know that when you're in Christ, you know what Scripture will say? <clears throat> Pardon me, Second Corinthians chapter. That just means I need to preach longer. Second Corinthians chapter five. You know what Scripture will say? If you're in Christ, you're a new creature, a new creation. How many are thankful that the same God who created all that is can cause for you and I to become new creations in Christ? Yes. Dependent upon His power. And I've got good news for you. How many notice this world, even though it has some beautiful elements, but it's a fallen world. Yes. Anybody know that to be true? Oh, yeah. right? right now, if the line and the land lay down together, it don't work out so good for one of them. Yes. All right? Aren't you thankful that one day this God of creation... This God of new creation in the hearts and lives of those who put their trust in Him is also the God who will make a new heaven and a new earth. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. And it depends upon Him and His power because He is not dependent or contingent upon anything or anyone. Look at the next verse here. John chapter 5, verse 25 to 26. These are the words of Jesus. If you had a red letter edition, as I often say, these words would be in red. Although whether they're in red or not, if they're in the word of God, God has given us these words. But this is the words of Jesus. John 5, 25 to 26. He says, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen. I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Now let me give you a little bit of context here. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, uh, begins with a man at the pool of Bethesda. You remember that story? Yes. He's laying there by the pool. He's a lame man. He's paralyzed. And Jesus comes and says to him, do you want to be well? And he says, well, there's no one to get me into the pool because they thought at the time if they could get to the pool fast enough, and he just the waters, the person would be healed. Now I can't get in the pool. I'm, I'm... And what does Jesus do? He says, take up your pallet, take up your bed and walk. And the man who had been lame... Now he takes up his bed and he's walking. Yeah, now, I don't know about you, but if I saw that, I'd be rejoicing. Yeah. Here's a man who was lame and he's rejoicing. The religious leaders see that though. The religious leaders of Jesus say, says, when did this happen? It happened on the Sabbath. Who healed you? We want to get it. Because they had a tradition that you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. They considered it work. Those who have read the Gospels, you know that Jesus was often confronted for doing various miracles on the Sabbath. Because the religious leaders had traditions you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. That was considered work. Now, again, I am amazed that these religious leaders, again, I've mentioned it before, but from a pastoral perspective, when we offer up these prayer requests and I hear a praise report like, Ryan, doing better, or, or more responsive from, from Matthew, I, I hear about these, my heart rejoices that, yeah. that something positive, something good, God has extended his goodness and has been so kind. To move on situations and circumstances. But these fellows' first reaction was on the Sabbath. Now I will tell you, you can search in your Strong's Concordance. You can search on your Google machine. You can read all of the scriptures and you will not find where God prohibited. That means made it where they could not heal on the Sabbath and said that that was a law. You won't find it anywhere. Because it wasn't God's word that said that. It was the traditions of men that said that. And they had elevated their tradition above God's word. And Jesus got on to them for such things. Nowhere did it say he couldn't heal himself. Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. And this man, he didn't know who had healed him at first. He finds out that it's Jesus. He goes and turns Jesus in, so to speak. He said it was Jesus who did it. So the religious leaders go to Jesus and said, what you doing? That's Ben's paraphrase. <laughs> and Jesus says this in John 5, 17. Jesus says, my father is working until now, and I am working. I love that verse. That means was working, is working, will be working. It says I was, my father was working, I was working. And John 5, 18 was the religious leaders want to kill Jesus. They're mad at him. Why? Because they understood by Jesus saying that his father was working and I am working. They understood Jesus is equating himself with God. Amen. Those who say that Jesus, there are many even so-called scholars who say Jesus never uh, compared himself to God. They haven't read the Gospels. They haven't read the Bible. All the time Jesus was saying such things. And the, the Jews understood what he was saying. That's why they wanted to kill him. It's because he's claiming to be God in the flesh. 
John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He's referring back to the Old Testament uh, name of God. I am Yahweh. I am who I am. And what happened is they want to kill him. And so in John 5, they're upset with Jesus. But what is Jesus' response? Amongst other things, he says this. The Father has life in himself. And just as the Father has life in himself, he is given unto the Son, that is to Jesus, to have life in himself. You know, the Jews at the time, they saw that God had three keys that only God could do. No one else could do. One came from Deuteronomy chapter 28, that only God could bring rain for the crops. You know, Deuteronomy 28, you'll be blessed in the country, blessed in the blessed. Part of that blessing was that God would open up the crops if the people obeyed. And they said only God could do that. Same thing was this coming from Genesis chapter 30, where Jacob's wife Rachel, who was barren for uh, uh, many, many years, what her womb was open, said, Only God can open up a womb. From Genesis 30. And then the third came from Ezekiel 37, 13. Remember the valley of dry bones? Yes. The prophet's there. And God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, speaking to the prophet, can these bones live? And I tell you, <laughs> some of the positive confession preachers of our day would say, Ezekiel should have said, of course they can live. I'm going to speak life into them. But Ezekiel had the better sense. God, you know. <laughs> How do we know God's the one who knows? Yes. And so he tells Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones. And he does prophesy. And the bones start coming together. And the bones are given life. And it said only God can give life. God has the key of life. The key to the rain of the crops. The key to opening up the womb. The key of life. And more than just natural life. But most importantly, spiritual life. How many know, if it is that you have natural life, God used your parents and their parents and their parents in order to get you there, right? Okay. All right? And how many know, if you have spiritual life, it's not because somehow you earned it. It's not because somehow you achieved it. It's because Jesus died on the cross and graciously would give it unto you if you would but receive. How many are thankful for that? He is the, the John chapter 11 when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus has life in himself. What does that mean? That means that the same aseity of God, that he's not contingent, that we apply to the Father, is also applied, of course, to the Spirit. But here, specifically to the Son as well. And I will tell you, to reject the Son means to reject the Father. And that's important for us as Christians to say, because there's a lot of people, again, say, I believe in God. Things are okay between me and God. Do you believe in Jesus? Well, he was a good man, a good prophet. Was he the Savior of the world? They'll say no. Was he God in the flesh? Well, no. Did he rise from the dead? Well, no. That's just, listen, if you reject the Son, you've rejected the Father. That's right. A Okay, the seity of God means this, that he is non-contingent, and he has life in himself. And aren't you thankful if he has life? And we can't, listen, again, in our experience, we can't, we look at pictures of our relatives and know somehow they were used to bring us here, right? We look even in our spiritual life and you look and see those who've been instrumental and in God using to help bring us to a faith in the preacher that God would raise up to bring his word to us. How many are thankful for that? Amen. But God has life in himself and aren't you thankful? When he has life in himself, he can extend in genuine truth and sincerity and power life to those who believe in him. Amen. Look here next. Psalm 93, verses 1 to 2. The Lord reigns. I want to stop with that for just a moment. The Lord. You see how Lord is in all caps? That means that that is the proper name of God. Some will say Jehovah. I think it's probably better to say Yahweh of God. And it literally means I am who I am or I will be who I will be. God revealed himself that way to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. When Moses said, you're calling me to lead these people out. Who shall I say to me? What's your name? And he says, I am who I am, Yahweh. Four Hebrew letters. You okay, Bob? Okay. Yahweh. Okay, again, some will say Jehovah. But Yahweh, Jehovah. That's a proper name of God. Can I tell you, but even the, what that name is, I am who I am, I will be who I will be, it shows that God is self-existent. He's not contingent upon anyone else. He's not, I am who I am, depending upon what this one says or that one does. How many know he is God all by himself? So the Lord, what does he do? The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. 
Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The Lord reigns. That means he was reigning. He is reigning. He shall yet be reigning. The Lord reigns. When we, if you're a student of history, you like here in the United States, I would say most everybody in the world would say the United States is probably the number one power in the world at the present time. Although, who knows how long that will last? We don't know. But most people would say such a thing. We tend to think such a thing, right? As far as military, economic, these sorts of powers. But when you think of our history, right? We have roots going back to England and roots going back to this one and roots going back. The kingdom did not just jump up from nowhere. There's roots that extend back from somewhere. You study history, the Roman Empire, right? It lasted for so many centuries and yet it fell apart. All right, it came from somewhere. There was groups of people that got together and they were formed the Roman Empire. They expanded throughout the world. The Greek Empire before that. Empires come and empires go if you study through history. They come from somewhere. Someone comes and dominates them eventually. So many years pass and the process seemingly repeats itself over. But the Lord reigning, he was reigning in the past. He is reigning now. He will reign in the future. What does that mean? The seity of God means his kingdom is forever. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever it says his throne the last verse we read here from this song was from everlasting to everlasting we can understand in some way not fully but we can get the idea of something extending forever but going forever as well in the past god's kingdom he and him as king has always been will always be and is right now how many are thankful his kingdom does not depend upon the kingdoms of this world kingdoms come and kingdoms go but aren't you thankful God's kingdom is forever? Amen. Look here next. It says here. He has clothed himself with majesty and with strength. Clothed himself. In other words, where did he get this strength from? From himself. Where did he get his majesty from? From himself. It's not as if some... You, you ever look uh, and someone will say, if you want the picture of... Uh, uh, what shall we say? If you want the picture of a speeder, someone who drives real fast, when you look in the dictionary, you'll see my dad's picture. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, right? You ever heard somebody say something like that? With some kind? Look in the dictionary, you'll see such and one's picture, right? Because they're maybe trying to poke it one a little bit, you know, or, 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 or make some kind of a point. If you were to look in the dictionary, for Matt, God is the one who even gives these things definitions. No one gave him majesty. He is majestic in his nature. No one gave him strength. He is strength in his very nature. No one gave him knowledge. Any of these attributes we've talked about over these weeks, he has all knowledge in his very nature. No one made him to where he wouldn't change over time. He is that in and of himself. How many are thankful he's girded himself with yes. righteousness from everlasting to everlasting. This psalm, by the way, I love to give you context. Psalm 93 was written by someone uh, that was coming out of the Babylonian exile. A child of God that was coming out of the a child of Israel that was coming out of a Levitical uh, uh, person in the worship of God that was coming out of Israel. And they wrote this psalm because the people started to get discouraged. They had seen all kind of trouble in their kingdom that was destroyed and in the kingdoms even when they had been exiled. And now here's they're trying to build things up again. And he says he wants to remind them the Lord reigns forever. His kingdom has always been. And how we're thankful for that. Amen. Look here next. Psalm 50. I love these. I love this psalm. Uh, I thought about preaching this whole psalm, but we only got another couple hours this morning. Psalm 50 <laughs> and verse 10 says this. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. You ever heard that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? You ever heard? <laughs> Usually it goes something like this. Yeah. God owns a cow on a thousand hills. And if you just give a certain something into, the, into this particular one, this two, then God's going to catch you in one of those cows for you. Anybody ever heard a sermon like that? God help us. 
There's the old, you know how I love the old songs, right? Well, there's most, a lot of those old songs that have good theology, and then there's some other ones. And uh, <laughs> there's this old Southern Gospel song that says, I'm, I'm rich in faith and hope and love. And that, it's kind of got a catchy chorus, and it's got some truth to it. But it begins with, my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and I believe I own at least one. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you, you missed the point. If you read Psalm 50, if you read Psalm 50, here's what's going on. It is God bringing his people into the courtroom. And he brings his people into the courtroom and he calls heaven and earth to witness against them. You read, that's a theme in the Old Testament. It's common. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Joshua said, I call heaven and earth to witness. God brings his people into the courtroom in Psalm 50. I'm calling heaven and earth to witness against you. And he confronts them in the opening verses, the first half of this psalm, basically. He confronts them about ritualism. What is that? That means that they were bringing their offerings. They were bringing and doing certain religious things unto the Lord, but their heart wasn't in it. And they thought that somehow God needed this, that they were doing God a favor. And God tells them this is part of the response of God to them thinking that somehow they're doing God a favor by doing these religious rituals. God comes to them and says to them, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Do you think I need you? That's the tenor of this. Saying, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Do you think that I need what you're offering for me to be God? Do you think I need what you're offering to uphold my truth? Do you think I need what you're offering in order to uphold some religious system? Because if you do, you're sadly mistaken. God says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Now, don't, God's kind of, why would he keep that from happening? <laughs> yeah, right? Some people say, oh, God, but that, God is always just so nice and warm. And Have you read your Bibles? <laughs> he lets people have it. Is that because he's hateful? No. It's because he's fully righteous. And if you don't understand his righteousness, you'll never understand his love and his salvation that he forgives sinners. And here it is, is that God is confronted. And now, the last part of the verse is if you read from Verses 12 and on, you'll read he confronts them about rebellion. That they rebelled against the Lord. And because judgment hasn't come upon them yet, they think they're getting away with it. And God will even tell them in the course of this song, he says, you think I'm just like you. And he says, I'm not just like you. <laughs> and how many know he is and he's far above. Right. So I can read all that. This might be my favorite passage of the day, Psalm 50. Y'all read it. And, and part of the reason why it is is because this verse about the cattle on a thousand hills so often taken out of context. But here it is. Can I tell you? Does God need for us to worship Him, for Him to be God? <laughs> Are you kidding yourself? Does God need for us to offer ourselves and our lives or our time, our talent, our treasure for Him to be God? No. God is God all by Himself. Does He need us? No. But is it a joy? Is it a privilege to be a part of what God would do? And not just in the externals, but with the internals. Is, is that a joy, a privilege? That God in His graciousness would extend to you and me? Absolutely. How many are thankful for that privilege? Look here next. Romans 11, 33-36. Oh, the depth, both of the riches, uh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Now I will tell you, this might, I don't, this might be somewhat of an of a arguable statement, but not too arguable. If you were to search through all the scripture for the one that had the greatest revelation of who God is, except for Jesus, who is God in the flesh, of course, I would say Paul had such a great revelation. Some might put others at the top, and if you do, that's okay. It doesn't matter. It's not about who's the greatest apostle. But how many know Paul had a great knowledge of who God was? And when he is used by God to write the book of Romans, I mean, Romans, you read through there, and as you read, you will find that whether you're a Jew and had the law of God, the Old Testament, or whether you're a Gentile and you didn't, 
have that as part of your background or heritage or knowledge that all are shut up in disobedience because we've all broken the law of God. And you'll find that whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile, you do not earn your salvation before God because you cannot stay away from enough bad in the eyes of men or do enough good in the eyes of men to earn your salvation. And that salvation, both to the Jew and to the Greek, Paul will say in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and then unto the Greek. How many are thankful we're saved by grace? In fact, those who preach the gospel, uh, many have no doubt uh, the verses that you will use to minister to people when you're teaching. There's so many you can use, but Romans is a common source of material to say that all the sin falls short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many are thankful? That the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. How is one saved? Well, by confessing with the mouth and believing with the heart in genuine sincerity that God the Father has raised Jesus the Son from the dead. That if you're in Christ, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. How many thankful for this? All those verses come to us from the pages of the book of Romans. And Paul, after talking about how all are shut up under sin, talking about how the gospel's by grace through faith in Christ, talking in Romans chapter 8 about how right now this fallen world is groaning, and we groan, and even in some sense the Spirit of God groans in Romans chapter 8. How many of this fallen world will make you groan a lot? A lot of trouble, a lot of groaning. Then you read about the way of salvation, you read about God's plan for Israel even in the, in, the, in the coming future. And all of these things. And what is it that Paul says? I love these words that we begin with. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How many know it would be overwhelming? Right? You, you just can't even hardly contain it. All. Oh, the depth of the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of God. And this is the Apostle Paul saying such things. Who was given such great revelation. How unsearchable is judgment, unfathomable his ways. And then verse 36 will be where we'll close today. For from him and through him and to him are all things. That means from him, he's the source of all things. Through him means by which all things exist. You know, scripture says that nothing came into being except he brought it into being and says that he upholds the world by the word of his power. One moment of him not doing that, I mean, I don't even know how to conceive of how the world would explode, implode, or whatever imploding it would do. And then the last thing, to him. God's the ultimate end goal. Well, you know, from him, through him, and to him, that pretty much covers the bases, right? This is the God who does not depend upon anyone or anything to be God or to be who he is. I didn't have time this morning to go out. You know, there are some who preach the gospel and say, well, God created humanity because he was lonely. He was lonely and he needed someone to love. So he created humanity. Read John 17, where Jesus in the high priestly prayer is talking about the love and glory that he and the Father had before the worlds were even created. God was self-satisfied. He did not need you and me. And some people say, well, that makes me feel, you're making me feel small this morning, Brother Ben. Can I tell you, the smaller we view ourselves and the bigger we view God, the better off we'll all be. I promise you that. But I will tell you this as well. This part may encourage you. It's one thing. How many know? I, I go to I go to work every day, Monday through Friday, most days. We had some Mondays off here a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Not tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> Any of you ever went to work though? And it wasn't just because you're just rip roaring to go to work. <laughs> you need to go to work because you like to eat, That's and your family right. likes to eat. <laughs> Me and you'll say sometimes, you'll say, you say, Daddy, why don't you just stay home this week? I said, I would love to, but we like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? There'll be all sorts of things that, 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 and, and that don't mean, I mean, maybe you have a job that you always love, although I bet even a job you always love has its days. Sometimes I love my job. 
there's two or three periods of the day, and then there's a couple other classes where I have to, uh, I have to share some students with the brother next door. <laughs> share, sin, all the same. <laughs> all right. But I would tell you what happens here is this. There's a lot of things that we will do because we need something. Not necessarily because we want to do that particular thing. And we can point out all sorts of areas in life where we need something, so we want our, and, and, and we don't necessarily want, but we have a need, and then it makes our behavior be one thing or another. Can I tell you? God does not need you, and God does not need me. God was self-satisfied, fully content in who he was, dependent upon nothing or no one. And you say, well, that makes me feel small. Here will make you feel loved by God. Is it better to think that he needed you? Or better to think that he wanted you. That's right. How many know there's a difference? Yeah. And I don't know about you, but uh, of course the main thing, what, how it makes us feel is not what we base sermons on. We should base sermons on the truth of scripture, right? How, what, regardless of how it maybe makes people feel at the time. All right? But I will tell you, when, you, when the truth of God is believed in our hearts and in our minds... That is truly what's best for us, too, because I would tell you, it'll make you think differently about your Heavenly Father and about Jesus who died for you and about the Holy Spirit who dwells you to make you think differently about God, to think He didn't need you to be God. He's God all by Himself. He didn't need you for Him to be happy because He was fine without you. But He wanted us and He died on what He created us. He died on the cross that there might be the way of salvation through Christ for all who repent of sin and put trust in Him. And one day we'll finally fully praise Him forever. And not only, so to speak, do we praise Him, but think of this, Zephaniah 3.17, He rejoices over us with singing, not because He needed us, but because He wanted us. And He chooses to have joy when it is that we praise Him and worship Him and, 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 and put trust in Christ. How many are thankful? Yes. Amen. So again, though this... You might, uh, a seity is not a word that you won't find it in the Strong's Concordance and you won't find it in your, by the way, it means of self. It's a Latin word, it means of self. And it means that God's the only one that is of himself. But you won't find it in the pages of scripture necessarily. But the idea you do find, and how many are thankful, that it means your God who's made promises is not contingent upon some other power. He is the one that has power, knowledge, virtue, unchangeableness, goodness, love, holiness in and of himself. And that if you're a follower of him, it's not because he just so needed you and he, not because he wanted you. And that's good news. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for your word. And Lord, if there's any here this morning that know not Christ, they've not repented of sin and put trust in him alone. I pray that whatever, whether it be some false religious system or some works-based worldly philosophy, whatever it is, that has their mind to thinking that they don't, that they might not be a sinner. Well, scripture says we all are. Or to think that somehow there's some other way of salvation other than Christ. Scripture says there isn't one. And I pray that they would indeed put their trust in Christ. The only one who can save. That they come in something like this this morning through the conviction of your spirit. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children this morning, whether of recent time or perhaps years, decades of life, may we never lose the wonder, like the great Apostle Paul here, who just explodes in a God-inspired praise, all oh, the depths of the riches of knowledge, to think about you, God, and your nature that you've always been and you always will be, and you don't depend upon anything or anyone, you're God all by yourself. Lord, to think of that holy, high God who is so far above our ability to comprehend fully such things. To think that you would not only create, but to think that you would send your son to die on a cross that we might be forgiven and be new creations. Not because someone had forced it for Jesus the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus said no one took his life from him, but he laid it down willingly. God, we thank you.
We thank you for your love and for your will and for your goodness extended to your children. May we grow in the knowledge thereof and give you the glory thereby. Lord, for from you, through you, and to you are all things forever. And we say along with our passage this morning, amen. amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is a hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of his power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. God bless you today in Jesus' name.